I am honored to introduce our presenter and keynote speaker, Mr. Woody Williams. Herschel Woody Williams was born on a dairy farm in 1923 in Quiet Dell, West Virginia. He enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and served in the Battle of Iwo Jima in the 21st Marines, 3rd Marine Division. Mr. Williams' actions, commitment to his fellow service members, and heroism were recognized on October 5th, 1945, when he received the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Truman at the White House. Mr. Williams is the sole surviving Marine from World War II to wear the Medal of Honor. Without further delay, Mr. Woody Williams. Thank you, Tom, very much. Appreciate that. I don't want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this great program. And what a program it really is. I realize that it was a joint endeavor by the DAV and the Department of Veterans Affairs and, and its success has been nothing but a miracle, really. And when I view the, <clears throat> the accomplishments of the veterans who are taking part in this program, I'm enthralled and I wonder where the grit and the drive comes from. I believe it's the same drive that they exhibited while serving America in the armed forces. But those born at a time, at this time and in the time when they saw these veterans doing what they do, they thought what they were doing was just a common thing, but there's nothing common about what they do. The activity that these individuals are doing, skiing on one ski and participating in, in uh, basketball from a wheelchair, those are certainly not common, common things that would have happened many years ago. So let me take you back just a little bit to 1946, really 1945. When I came home in November of 1945, <clears throat> the war was over, of course. But those of us living in West Virginia, up in the northern part of the state particularly, had never even heard of the Veterans Administration that, as it was known at that time. It only, the Veterans Administration only had one location in the whole state of West Virginia, which was 230 miles from where I lived. I had never heard of the VA. The, the only place that existed was a 200 bed inpatient hospital. There was no such thing as an outpatient. If you went there, you were either admitted or not, but you had to become a patient in order to be admitted. And I had a friend that I became acquainted with right after I got home, and he lost his left leg in Europe. When he came home, he, they had issued him a prosthesis. It was one of the early ones that the army was issuing. And the VA at that point in time was not involved. But the limb that they gave him, the artificial limb that they gave him was one of those suction type limbs. And it worked pretty good apparently until he would sit down and then he would lose his suction and consequently would have to readjust himself and get the limb back in place. I was visiting his community as a veterans contact representative at the time. I was going to his city one day a week from an office that I had or that I occupied <clears throat> in my hometown of Fairmont. And he lived in a little town called Mannington, West Virginia. And I went there and they gave me a wee little office where I could have a desk and one chair. And of course, my job at that point was to assist veterans 
with their veterans benefits, the GI Bill and compensation, whatever. <clears throat> so I was in the office one day and, and Jim walked up the steps. There were three or four steps up to the uh, room where I was, where I had my office and they were wooden steps. So I heard this kind of a thump, thump, thump. And as he was coming up the steps and he got to the top of the steps, looked in my office, saw me at my desk, came in, sat down and reached down and picked up his artificial limb and just stuck it up on the edge of my desk. And he said, I want a new limb. And <clears throat> of course, I'm very new at my job at that point. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got it later, but I was very new at my job at that point. I had no idea how to get Jim Biederman a new limb. So we had no money with which we could make telephone calls. Wherever we called, we had to call collect or go to a payphone. That was our only options if it was long distance. But I had permission that I could call my home office in Huntington 230 miles away, and <clears throat> I could call collect. So I called my boss down there and told him what I had, and he said, well, can he get down here? And I said, no, he can't drive. Because at that time, we had no automatic transmissions in automobiles. His left leg was off, so he couldn't work the clutch, so he couldn't drive a car. So... <clears throat> I said, uh, but if you'll give me permission, I will bring him in. And he said, okay, put him in the car and bring him in. So the next day, I drove him to Huntington. At that time, all the roads were two lane. There weren't certainly no interstates. And it took five hours from where we were to drive to the Huntington office. And we got down there in the late afternoon. And... Uh, I knew nothing of what, what to do or how to do it. So my boss told me that there was a place within the city that was making artificial limbs. And we took him over there, they did the measurements and they agreed that that night they would make him a limb, find, find one that would, would uh, fit him. So we were back the next morning, got the limbs, then we drove back, back home. Well, Jim still couldn't drive an automobile. But in about 1948, Oldsmobile came out with an automatic transmission. And they were the first people that I know of, or even remember, that had an automatic transmission. And the VA at that point, with the push of the veterans organizations, had allotted $1,600 for the purchase of a car and the new equipment that would go in it so it could be operated by uh, amputees. And so he bought a car and he bought an Ozomobile quite naturally and began driving for the first time uh, since, he, since he got home. My job as a veterans counselor, we were known as contact representatives back at that time and they later changed it to veteran services officer. But at that time, my job with the VA came about very unusually. I, I, was, I had a job working for a construction company. I was kind of a supply man. Uh, I would order tools or equipment and then check it in when, when it arrived. And I got this phone call from a fellow with the VA. And he introduced himself and asked me if I would be interested in coming and working for the Veterans Administration. Well, I was a country boy. I knew absolutely nothing about administrative work of any kind. And, <clears throat> and uh, I said, well, what would I be doing? And he told me I would be in an office and I would be interviewing people. And, and I said, no, I don't, I don't want that job. I didn't want to be in an office. So a few weeks went by and I got a second phone call from a different person asking the same question. And I was ready to turn him down when the thought came to my mind, well, I wonder what this job pays. So I asked him, what's the job pay? 
He says, $2,980 a year. And I said, I'll take it. I had never heard or even dreamed of ever making that much money in one year. So I took the job. They had to go for three months of training to become a contact representative and then began working in the field, servicing veterans and, and their families and survivors and that type of thing. But at that time, compensation from the VA, if you were 100%, you got $100 a month, $10 for each 10%. Jim was rated at 60% because he had only lost one leg. Had he lost both legs, then he would have been entitled to 100%. But <clears throat> uh, he was entitled to the 60%. And it was quite some time before uh, they began adjusting compensation and certainly without the service organizations supporting and demanding that the veterans receive benefits that they should receive, those things would have certainly never happened. Being the recipient of the Medal of Honor that I had never heard tell of until I got to Washington in October of 1945, when I learned that's what I was going to receive, but I had no idea what it was. I'd never seen one, I'd never heard of one, and there were 13 of us scheduled to receive the Medal of Honor on the same day. And of course, we were either uh, Navy corpsmen or Marines. And we gathered on October the 5th, 1945 on the White House lawn and President uh, Harry Truman presented each one of us our Medal of Honor. I have no, or had no concept of what effect it was going to have on my life. I didn't know that it was going to completely change my life, which it did. I became a public figure for the first time. I was very shy, I was bashful. I certainly did not want to appear before a group of people or to be a speaker of any kind. But because of receiving the Medal of Honor, the demand was that I had to do that. It took a tremendous amount of adjustment. And it took an awful lot of, of practice at night uh, with my wife sitting in one room and me in the other room. And I'm, uh, she would give me something to talk about and then I would have to talk about that. And I was just making up words, but uh, at least I was speaking. And we did that night after night after night. So eventually I became able through practice and determination that I could appear before groups and be reasonably comfortable with what I was talking about. And of course, I always invariably had to talk about what I did to receive the Medal of Honor. I did not consider myself of doing anything extraordinary in any way. I was doing just the job for which other Marines had trained me to do. Had they not trained me, then I would have not been able to accomplish the mission that, that I finally did. But that was the very best therapy I believe I could have ever received. We had no place to go to. The only medical service that we had at that time were county health departments. That, that was the only service we could, we could go to. But over the time, over a few years, the VA established field offices in most of the major cities in every state. I can only speak primarily of West Virginia, but we had 16 field offices scattered around over the state with a regional office in Huntington. And each uh, office occupied by one contact representative and a clerical assistant uh, usually we would try to employ widows 
of veterans that had sacrificed their life in the armed forces as our secretaries. That was one of the goals that we strive for. And <clears throat> eventually the VA continued to expand. And today we have four VA medical centers in the state of West Virginia. Uh, one of them or two of them are uh, 200 bed hospitals. Uh, the one near me is a really a 60 bed hospital with tremendous outpatient service. And the other one is about 250 bed hospital and they're located in four different locations in the state. There's 10 medical centers, uh, small community centers in the state for veterans to, to go to for service. Uh, nationally, we have uh, Vietnam veterans uh, offices and all of those things came about I think primarily because of the insistence and the, the effort of veterans organizations like the DAV and the other veterans organizations that we have in the country. We still don't have all we need, but we certainly have a great deal more than what we had when I first came home and when the World War II veterans came home, yet we had a little more than what they had in World War I. So, it has changed drastically and tremendously for the, for the good and for the better. And fortunately, services like this program that you all have that are providing a service to veterans that would not be available otherwise is giving them a life that they could have never experienced prior to or even near World War II era. So I know that the camaraderie and, and the sharing that they do with each other has got to be tremendous therapy for them. And on behalf of myself and certainly those that are participating, you are to be congratulated and certainly thanked for what you're doing to make it all possible. The VA today is nothing like uh, we, we had in prior years that uh, there's a different attitude than, than we had back in my day. Uh, it seemed to me like back in the earlier days, the VA didn't do any advertising. They weren't allowed to do advertising. Uh, if you wanted to go to the VA, it was up to you to find the place to go because they weren't listed in any, basically any veterans organization magazines. And uh, most of them were not listed even in telephone directories back at, back at that time. So the services today are so much better and so very important in the lives of those who suffer the severe injuries and, and other types of disabilities as a result of service to our country and, and in the armed forces. I've had so many miracles happen in my life. Uh, most of them, and in fact, all of them came about by what others did more so than what I did. Had it not been for those who took the ball and ran with it, those miracles certainly would never have happened. <clears throat> One of those is the program that we're involved in now that I, no doubt is the most satisfying, emotional program that I have ever been involved in. You know, of all the wars that we've had, many and too many, for whatever reason, we as a society and as a, as a people never did anything in the way of recognizing and paying tribute and honor to the families that gave one of their own for all of us and for America and for our freedom. 
Gold Star Mothers started in World War One. A mother who had a son serving in Europe wanted the people in the community to know that that they did have someone serving in the war. And she arranged to get a blue star that she could hang in her window that indicated that she did have somebody in war. And a number of individuals, particularly in California at that time, gathered together and they began having those blue stars in their windows. Then, as it went along, deaths, of course, sacrifices were being made. So she decided that they needed something more than the blue star. They needed a gold star that would symbolize the fact that they had lost a loved one in war. So she had a flag of the same size as the blue star flag made and she could hang that over the blue star in the window to say that this home has lost a loved one. And it gathered momentum and World War I was right active. But then after the war, we dropped it. it nobody was doing anything. Gold Star mothers were reasonably recognized in many of our cities uh, and states across the nation, but in some areas, absolutely nothing. No recognition, no mention of gold star mothers at conventions or anything of that nature at all. And it wasn't until <clears throat> in the 50s, the 1950s, that I became aware of gold star mothers. And didn't understand anything about it. Uh, there was no place to go to at that point in time to gather information. But occasionally those words or that term would come up, talk about Gold Star Mothers. But nothing was ever said about Gold Star Dad or any other relative of that individual who had sacrificed their life. So in about 2010, 2009 or 2010, uh, I was invited to speak to a group about 200 miles from my home. And the group was a group of senior citizens. And uh, I guess I had reached that age at that point where I could become one. So, uh, and they assigned me the topic to talk about, asking me to talk about what are we doing about, or how can we encourage patriotism? How can we get our youth involved in patriotism? And I was speaking to that subject, but as I look back over the crowd and there was a good turnout for the, for the occasion, I saw a number of ladies with gray hair because of senior citizens. And the thought went through my mind, wonder if we have any gold star moms in this group. So I stopped what I was talking about and said to them, I'm going to ask the question. And if, if uh, the question fits you or if you are uh, what I'm going to ask, would you please just raise your hand? So I asked, were there any gold star mothers in the group? And a great number of hands went up. I was uh, taken back at the number. And then I realized that the, that community, that city had had a National Guard unit in World War II that was activated and sent to the Philippines. And when the surrender took place there, and the death march started, many of those individuals that had been activated became a part of that death march. And consequently, many of them never got to come home. And that is why that particular community had so many gold star mothers. And we paid proper 
respect and honor and tribute to them. And then I went on and closed out my, my remarks and everybody was leaving the hall. But one man stayed and he was sitting just a few rows back from the front. And I looked at him and he's sitting there with his head down and I wondered what was wrong with him. And so I said to him, sir, is there something I can do for you, some way I can help you? And I got no response from him. So I'd had some material that I'd passed out like flag etiquette uh, pamphlets and some other stuff. And I was getting that, all that stuff back in my briefcase and I heard him walking toward me. It was a wooden floor and he walked up to me and I turned around and as I looked at him, tears were rolling down his cheeks. And the only thing he said to me was, dads cry too. That hit me like a ton of brick. I asked him, would he share with me? what was on his mind. So we sat down and he told me that he was the only son of his family, mother and father, and they were both deceased. He and his wife only had one son. The wife had died just a few months earlier of cancer. The boy, had already enlisted into the army, had his reporting date to go to Fort Leonard Wood for his basic, and he could have gotten his contract canceled because of, uh, of the circumstances, but he decided not to do that. He told his dad he still wanted to serve. So he went to basic, then got shipped to Afghanistan and there sacrificed his life. Dad was home alone when the military came to tell him that his son was not coming home. He had no one to grieve with. He had no close friends that he could share with. And consequently, he just suffered alone. And after he and I talked and shared together for some time, I went out and got in my car and started driving home. And I thought, surely we must do something in our state of West Virginia to pay tribute to the families that had sacrificed so many. In fact, we have a veterans memorial on our Capitol grounds that has 11,474 names on it. All of those sacrificed their lives in the armed forces of our country. Yet we had not done anything in the whole state of West Virginia to ever pay tribute or honor or mention Gold Star families at all. Yes, Gold Star mothers occasionally, but the rest of the family, nothing. As I continued to wrestle with that thought, I, just, I was on a committee at that time. Uh, we called it a veteran cemetery committee because we were getting our very first veteran cemetery in the state of West Virginia, state cemetery. We had a VA federal cemetery in the Northern part of the state, but in our part, those living in our area, they, they didn't bury their deceased that far away because of mileage. But uh, I was on this committee uh, trying to decide where we need to put the flagpoles and the administrative building and all that sort of thing that the committee had to decide to tell the contractor where to put it. And I was on that committee and we were meeting about every other week at the time so at the next meeting of that committee, I mentioned them what happened. I told them the same story I just told you, basically. And I said, we must do something in this state 
to recognize these families who sacrificed a loved one for all of us and for America. And of course, as per usual, you open your mouth and stick your foot in it and they say, oh, it's a good idea, you do it. And that's exactly what they said, you know, well, what would you want to do? And I had no idea what I wanted to do. And they said, well, come back in two weeks, come back with some idea and we'll talk about it. So I went, I came home and with the help of one of my daughters, we did all kinds of diagrams and drawings and whatever. But we finally came up with what we thought was a good idea. And it was a panel uh, made of granite or marble. And at that time, I'm not even sure I knew the difference between the two. But <clears throat> uh, it would have uh, something on it about the community from which this individual uh, came, where he lived, or she lived. And <clears throat> that would have something about the family that without a family, there would have been no sacrifice. And then we decided that with all the new uh, information and, and uh, what we were doing with the flag on Iwo Jima, that that ought to be a national symbol with the flag that we would put on it. And we did that. And then we had a individual solid person who are solid in the in the granite or marble uh, saluting the old saluting the flag <clears throat> and then the other panel was a sacrifice panel something to indicate the sacrifice of that individual and I presented that to the group and the committee said well that's that that's great that we will We'll vote on that. It was accepted. And then we started working with an architect of how to do it, how to put it together, how tall it would be, how long it would be, what the size of the panels would be, how much it would weigh, and all that um, uh, information. And as we were working with it, with the architect, I was explaining the different panels to him. And when I got to the one where the individual was saluting old glory, he said, why don't we cut that out? That person is not here. That person never got to come home. And if we cut it out, it will indicate that that person is missing. Actually, that made, as far as I'm concerned, the panel. It, it said everything that could possibly be said about sacrifice and honor and love and love of country. So that's what we finally came up with. And we had to set it, we decided we'd apply for a nonprofit organization to do this, because we had no money. <clears throat> and uh, when we applied, they said, well, you got to have a goal because that's some kind of a goal. So I said, well, let's just set a goal of if we can get one of these in all of the, the 50 states that we had. And we were thinking basically of the capitals of those states. But if we can just get one in every state and that became our goal. Never dreaming that we'd ever reach it, but at least we said that's what we'd want to do. And so we did the first one on uh, October the 2nd, 2013. And we dedicated it that day in West Virginia, thinking we're done. We have done what we were supposed to do and, and uh, we're gonna let the other states do whatever they wanna do. But it got on the internet and the son of a father who had sacrificed his life in Vietnam from Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, saw it. He saw it on the interstate, internet, internet. And <clears throat> so he called and said, how do I get one of these at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania? So at that time we had no real diagrams or anything, but we explained to him what we had done and we got pictures of what we did and sent to him. 
And he began working on it. He raised money himself to put the second one on the grounds of the Medal of Honor Grove at Valley Forge. Here again, thinking, well, he did it, but we're still not, we're, we're still done because we're not pushing it for any other state. The third one that came into existence was in Tampa, Florida. There was a boys' school, Jefferson School for Boys down there. They had about 250 boys in that school at that time. And one of those boys had lost his grandpa in the armed forces. And he saw it on the internet. And now this, this boy was about 14 years old, but he thought we need one of those on our school grounds. So he went to the school people, asked if they could if they could have one on the school grounds. And of course the school said, once he showed them what it was all about, they said, well, yeah, that'd be okay, but we don't have any money. And he said, well, what if we boys raise the money? And they said, well, if you, you raise the money, then we'll, we'll agree. I don't think they ever thought that they, those boys would. It took them almost two years, but they, mowed lawns and sold t-shirts and did everything, uh, washed cars and whatever, but they raised $60,000. And that was number three in the country. And then it continued to grow. Today, we have 79 of those Gold Star family memorials in various cities around America in all 50 states. In West Virginia, we have seven communities already have one, five more are in the process. Ohio has 10. They've got four or five more in the process. Texas is coming on with a great number and eventually they will outdo everybody. You know, everything's bigger and better in Texas, they tell us that. But that's my story. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity of sharing that with you. And believe me, I am very appreciative of what you're doing for the veterans of America. Now, if anybody has any question, I'll be glad to try to answer it. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Williams. It's truly, truly an honor. We could have listened for several more hours. I was, I was ready ready to get a popcorn ready. So I'll, I actually have a question for you um, really quick while everyone else, I would encourage you to come up with questions for Mr. Williams. Um, but my question for you is why did you join the Marines? <laughs> well, in uh, early right after World War II, I had two brothers who were drafted. And of course they were drafted into the army because at that time that you had to go to the army if you were drafted. And they fortunately, after their basic training, or as a result of their basic training, one of them was stationed in Maryland, the other one was stationed in Ohio, and they could thumb home on Friday night and be home on Saturday and then thumb back on Sunday. And so they would come home occasionally on a weekend, and they wore their Army uniform because they'd taken all the civilian clothes away from them. And so they wore their army uniform. And it, I don't mean to, to insult anybody in the army, but that was the ugliest army or ugliest uniform I've ever seen. It was that old wool brown uniform that you couldn't put a crease in it with a steamroller. And uh, I said, I don't want to be on that thing. We had a, a couple more, couple people in our community at different times that served in the Marine Corps during the depression years and when they get home one time a year for 30 days they called it a 30-day furlough they had to wear their dress blues all the time they were home that was a requirement and they were always very neat and sharp and they could get the girls too and of course that would appeal to a teenager you know so 
I guess I joined the Marine Corps because I liked that uniform better. That's a great answer. That's that makes total sense to me. <laughs> um, I want to I want to uh, again remind everybody on the call if you want to type in or raise your hand um, via the the chat function um, for any other questions. But otherwise, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep firing away at, at Mr. Williams because I as many as much as we can get out of you, we'll take it. So okay, good I'll enough. give a few seconds here to see. You'll get sick of hearing my voice anyway. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to give you another one. I don't want to. I don't want to waste our time with you. Um, have you ever gone back to Iwo Jima, and how was that? If you did, okay, yes, I have been there. Uh, been there two times. The first time uh, I went, it was rather an emotional experience, and I primarily went thinking I could find the location on Iwo, where I lost one of the best friends I've ever had in my whole life. Vernon Waters was a big six foot six individual, and I'm a five foot six runt to him, but he was my assistant flamethrower operator that had something happen to me that I couldn't perform. He would have had to take over that assignment. And we lost him on August the, uh, I mean, on uh, March the 6th, uh, 1945. And I was hoping I could find that location. I can see it in my mind. But when we got back to Iwo Jima, it had all greened up. The trees had read, bushes, if you would, uh, had greened up and couldn't see the contour of the ground or the land at all. So I had no idea where, where that happened, and it, that was a disappointment. But uh, the second time that I went back was a little more, well, less emotional and a little more really enjoyable, if you would. But it is so restricted today that uh, you really can't see a great deal. Uh, you can go up on Mount Suribachi but you can't get off of the highway or the roads that they have made on Iwo. You can't go in caves or pillboxes. Uh, you're not allowed to bring any souvenirs whatsoever, not even a 30 caliber cartridge. You're not allowed to bring anything off except sand itself. So, and you have, you're limited as to the number of hours that you can be there. So we were due to go back this past March when the virus hit. And of course that had to be canceled. And uh, we think there will be another schedule sometime this year uh, back to Iwo Jima. And if that happens, I, I plan to go. Uh, it's such a different place than what I have in my mind, what I can visualize about Iwo Jima during the, the actual combat. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. We, we do have a question here. Um, the ship that was named for you, I understand you came up with the motto. What was your inspiration? Well, uh, I think it was divine intervention, really. <clears throat> when they called me and told me that it, the ship was going to carry my name, I was absolutely floored. I never dreamed that this country boy from West Virginia would ever have the extreme honor and privilege of having a ship with his name on it. That, that never even entered my mind. But a fellow Marine, that Vietnam Marine, uh, about 18 or 19 years ago, well, longer than that now, but took 19 years to get it accomplished, uh, he had been down to Quantico and he saw a ship there with a name on it. And uh, it was a veteran uh, name on the ship. So when he got back, he called me and he said, uh, I'm going to start working on getting a ship name for you. And I said, well, Ron, 
that'll never happen. You, you'll be wasting your time. And he said, well, I'm going to start anyway. And he did. And he began gathering signatures and endorsements and all kinds of uh, witnesses to have a ship with my name on it. And eventually it happened. And when they called me and told me that that had been approved, uh, they also told me that I needed to come up with a motto for the ship because every ship has a motto. And I had no idea what that was. Uh, and they told me, well, you know, they, they gave me some examples of other mottos on other ships, like the fighting something or whatever. And uh, they said, think about it and see if you can come up with something. So I, one night I was lying in bed, I, I awakened about two o'clock and I was lying thinking about that. And these thoughts came to me where they came from. As I said, I think it was divine intervention. Uh, the words came, peace we seek, peace we keep. I jumped out of bed and wrote it down real quick because I wasn't sure I would remember it the next morning. And then I called them that day and I said, well, here's what I've come up with. And uh, they said, well, let me take it to the secretary and if he approves it, that's what we'll use. So the secretary approved it and today that ship has it in its uh, official seal, peace we seek, peace we keep. Thank you, thank you. We've got a couple more questions rolling in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sneak them in. Um, we have one, how many times have you been to the National Museum of the Marine Corps? What is your favorite time there? I probably have been there probably six times, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, when I guess my favorite thing to look at <laughs> is uh, the flag that flew on Mount Suribachi that they have in the, in the museum. Uh, I can stand there and look at that flag and so many, many thoughts go through my mind. So I guess that is my favorite, favorite spot of the World War II uh, museum. Uh, I am always thrilled when I drive close to it or buy it or go up the interstate and I can see that uh, flagpole sticking at an angle, the same as it was on Iwo Jima. Uh, when I see that, it always gives me a thrill because uh, so much sacrifice was made there and, and certainly not to take away from any others because war requires sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question here. What is your advice for civilians who have heroes and warriors coming back home? I know transitioning from the military can be really hard for some veterans. Do you have any advice for friends and family to make it easier for them to come home? I don't know that I have any advice. I think every one of them is kind of an individual situation, but I guess the, if, if I could say to an individual that was in doubt as to how to do this, I would say give that person all the love you can give them. Be considerate of the fact that they are a different person now than they were before they entered the armed forces. It does change, I believe, every individual. They take on a different thought process, a different lifestyle, uh, a different belief. And it takes a while for the families to get used to those changes that takes place in every individual. Uh, to that individual, I would encourage them Share, share your feelings, share your experiences. They ask about it and they're interested in it. They, they wanna know what happened before or back then. 
And rather than just hold that in and wrestle with it yourself, which I did for 25 years, share it. Tell others about it. It gives it a different perspective when you actually talk about it and open it up and look at it in a different light. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We, I just got another one that came in. So um, I want to, yeah, I want to ask you about seeing the flag on Mount Suribachi on February 23rd, 1945, and how did it impact the Marines on Iwo Jima? Okay. That's a good one. <clears throat> we had just gotten off of our boat, uh, Higgins boat, and uh, I finally got right up to the edge of the first airfield and our objective, we were told, was to cross the airfield and attack or try to break through the pillboxes that were on the other side. They had built hundreds of pillboxes to protect the airfield <clears throat> and uh, that was our objective. We were to eliminate the enemy within those pillboxes so we could move on through. And we kind of dug some kind of a hole in anything that we could in the sand at the edge of the pillbox. When all of a sudden, I'm looking opposite of Mount Suribachi. Mount Suribachi was back over my left shoulder. And <clears throat> suddenly the Marines around me began yelling or saying something about a flag. And some of them got up and they were firing their carbines and M1 rifles into the air. And I, I, I was really snowed at the moment as to what was going on. But then I looked back and looked up and there was, it was a second flag. The first one was a three by five flag. And I'm not even sure we could have seen it from where we were, but the larger flag had just been raised and it was sticking straight out. The wind had it blowing straight out and so I began doing the same thing the rest of them did. I, I got up and started firing my M1 in the air, celebrating the fact that Old Glory was firing on Mount Surobachi. And that was different than anything we'd ever done on any other island we'd ever taken. We'd always take the island, secure it, then put up the flagpole and put a flag on it. But this one was five days in. Now we're putting a flag on Mount Surobachi. And it lifted the spirit of every, I think, of every Marine on that island and anybody else that could see it. Because you could see that flag from anywhere on the island. Uh, the island being only two and a half miles wide and five miles long, you could see the thing from wherever you were. Even from the, from the ocean, you could see the flag flying. So it was a very spirit lifting occasion. Thank you, thank you. I think this is the last one we, we have time for. Um, why um, did you join DAV? Why did I join what? DAV. Oh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when I first got employed or became a contact representative, <clears throat> and probably not going to believe this, but it's a fact, absolutely. We had a a uh, national service officer of the DAV in our regional office in Huntington uh, by the name of Casey Jones. He was a West Virginian. He had worked with the Veterans Committee in Washington, which he didn't particularly like. So he, uh, he took the DAV training and they sent him down to Huntington as a veteran services officer for the DAV. So anytime we would go into Huntington for training, he was one of the individuals who would come and speak with us and tell us what the DAV was doing, what legislation they were pushing, uh, that type of thing. So Casey Jones and I became very close. And, and naturally, that encouraged me to become a, a member. <laughs> so I had no idea how many years I've been, but it's been a long, long time. I think back maybe 1947 or 48 uh, that I became a member. All right, thank you. Another one just rolled in. So I 
I'm, you tell me if you if you need to go, but I I'm guessing we're gonna all stay as long as you keep taking questions because you're so. I'm, I'm okay with that. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, do you feel like boot camp or whatever military school you went to prepared you for what you were going to experience? Oh, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I was born and raised in a large family, and. Uh, my father, uh, who died when I was 11, uh, but my brother that took over the farm that I would, grew up on, uh, they were, I would call them strict disciplinarians. Uh, they were raised the same way, so they just raised, they treated us as they had been treated. But because of that upbringing, uh, when they told you to do something, you didn't say, I don't want to do that or whatever. You just went, went and did it the very best that you could. And you didn't question anybody giving you an order to do something. So when I got in boot camp, whatever that drill instructor said was gospel to me. I'm going to do whatever he says I'm supposed to do. So I had absolutely no, no uh, difficulty in boot camp at all. But the training that we received, we were fortunate in my particular situation with, with our particular platoon. Uh, we had a couple individuals that had already been in combat. Now we're talking about 1943. So <clears throat> these guys had been in combat, either Guadalcanal or one of the islands after, uh, that had combat experience. So they could relate that information to us that somebody who had never been in combat had no idea what combat was all about. They did. That was tremendously beneficial to us because we, through their experience and then they re relaying that to us, gave us a very definite thinking or process to realize what combat was really going to be like. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have any current questions that are coming in right now. Um, I do want to let everybody know um, that if you do have additional questions, please email Teresa Parks and she she can work with Mr. Williams, I'm sure, to get some answers. Um, yeah, I, this, I think if, if you ever weren't good at speaking to groups, I don't really believe it. So this was <laughs> this was great. That practice all paid off. We could we could listen to you all night. Um, let me tell you one more one more incident. Yes. The day I received my Medal of Honor, a 17-year-old Marine received his Medal of Honor. He joined the Marine Corps when he was 14 years old. Of course, he lied about his age. He, he changed his own birth certificate to show he's 17, and he wrote a, a letter, signed his mother's name to it as if she had done it, and that gave him permission to enter the Marine Corps at 17, or at 14, <clears throat> thinking he was 17. And on Iwo Jima, he uh, pulled a couple grenades under his body and, and uh, as a result, received the Medal of Honor. So he was one of those individuals, never saw a bashful moment in his life. He was always outgoing and rather loud voice and that sort of thing. And he was about halfway through the 13 of us receiving the medal. And the president had something to say to each one of us. And he said to a number, including me, I would rather have this medal than to be president. That was one of his famous sayings. Or sayings. So this guy's name was Jacqueline Harold Lucas. And when uh, he said that to Jack, and of course a large group of people there, all kinds of Navy, Marine Corps people, and Congress people and whatever. Uh, Jack said in his big loud voice, when the president said, I'd, I'd rather have this medal than to be president. Jack said, I'll trade you. <laughs> we never let him forget that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, just like everything else you, you talked with us about, that just extraordinary stories. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do it. Um, thank you so much for your service. Obviously, your continued service. You worked at the VA. You, you keep giving and giving and giving and giving. 
um, thank you, thank you so much um, for myself, from all of us on this call. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to encourage everybody on the call to, to participate in future sessions for the Winter Sports Clinic at home. I remind you that these sessions are recorded, so we we can listen in to Mr. Williams' inspiring stories again. Uh, so thanks again so much, and uh, we look forward to, to having everybody join uh, for the rest of the week for the Winter Sports Clinic at home. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. Well, thank you for the honor of doing this. Appreciate it.